So many of you are focused on industrial for an asset class in the commercial world. So I wanted to make a video for you to give you my best tactics and tips around being a powerhouse industrial commercial real estate agent. I want to start things off with saying, if you would like to dominate the world of industrial, you're going to have to focus on a couple key things different than the large majority of other commercial real estate agents. So first things first, let's talk about the leads that you're going to be pulling because we're going to rewind the clock all the way to the very beginning of how do you get started here? It's about the leads that you pull. So when you're pulling leads in industrial real estate, there's a couple key things to keep in mind. One, you do not want to be prospecting individuals who have bought properties within the last five or 10 years, because if they bought it five or 10 years ago, the odds of them selling again are pretty low. Number two, you want to also be focusing on individuals who are probably not owner occupants. You want to find the individuals where they don't also occupy the building, which can commonly be correlated to an out of state owner. And point number three, you want to be focused on individuals who own one to three commercial properties. If someone owns 30 or 40 or 50 commercial real estate deals, that individual is probably not going to sell any of their real estate. They're probably not going to because their business is buying real estate. So in this instance, I probably would not be prospecting people who own a ton of property. I'd be rather focused on the individuals who own maybe one, two or three properties here and there. And they're kind of spread out or maybe in one little location. They only own a few properties and they're an out of state owner. That individual would probably be more likely to sell than somebody who's in the business of investing in real estate. And the last point when it comes to pulling lists are individuals who have low balances on their mortgages or the properties own free and clear. Because again, if they just, let's just say refinanced a year ago or two years ago when interest rates were maybe two and a half, three, four percent, they're probably not going to be looking to sell right now because they just did a cash out refinance recently. However, if they have owned the property for 10, 20, 30 years and they have a fairly low loan to value property, right? They might consider selling the property and taking a lump sum of cash. So make sure you're paying attention to this when you're pulling your lead lists. So the second part of this video is all about the questions to ask individuals when you're on your sales call specific to the industrial industry. So there's a couple key things we're going to talk about. Number one is leases. You're going to want to ask questions about the leases that are currently in place. What types of leases are they? Are they gross rent leases? Are they triple net leases? Who pays the utilities? When did they start? When did they end? And do they also include rental increases on an annual basis? And do they have any options? How long have they been there for? These are a lot of really important questions to ask when it comes to industrial real estate, because you want to get an understanding of the entirety of this property. Point number two is going to be the utility breakdown. The next couple pieces of this are describing the property. What are the ceiling heights? Ceiling heights are incredibly important when it comes to industrial properties. People love high ceiling industrial properties, especially if there's absolutely nothing in between. Maybe sometimes there's mezzanine levels where like on the side, oh, well, the, the first floor is 14 feet and then they have an office and then they have a second floor or a third floor, or whatever. No, you wanna have clear spaces. How high are the ceilings? Like people love mid 20s and 30 foot plus ceilings. When you have incredibly high ceiling heights, those are gonna be more valuable. Another couple of things are gonna be things that are describing the property like, do they have drive-ins and loading docks? For large manufacturing and shipping of industrial properties, they're gonna be looking for lots of loading docks and they're going to be looking for a couple drive-ins. This is going to be incredibly lucrative, especially for properties that have incredibly high ceiling heights and for even properties that have lower ceiling heights, like 14 or let's just say in the teens or low 20s, do those have loading docks and do they have drive-ins so they can still do large shipping logistics and manufacturing businesses. The next key points are going to be how is the building structured? Is the property owner occupied? This is a question like we talked about at the very beginning when it comes to pulling those lists, but sometimes you can say, just to clarify, do you occupy the property right now or is this just an investment for you? And if they say, no, 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 we occupy the property, great. So what percentage of the building do you occupy? Roughly how much square foot, right? So then, cause you gotta think about it. Let's just say they occupy 50% and then they rent out 50%. That means you're gonna have to structure a lease back for them to stay. Like, hey, John, just to clarify, you occupy 50% of the building, correct? How much square footage is that? Well, it's 20,000 of the 40,000 square feet. Okay, I understand. And just to clarify, did you plan on vacating the building at closing or would you like to stay and do a lease back? Well, we'd probably consider staying. So do you happen to have an idea of how much you can probably afford? Because right now the market rate is somewhere in the vicinity of $15 triple net, right? And you go into that, you know, the conversation right off the bat, where you can start asking questions because you understand the market. That's why it's important to know, do they occupy the building or 
is it just a straight rental for them? Another great question to ask is, is the building broken down into some office and majority warehouse or is it about 50-50? No, 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 there's about 20% office space and then 80% warehouse. Okay, great, so you told me the building's 40,000 square feet, so that means you're saying that the office takes up roughly 8,000 square feet and then the warehouse portion is 32,000 square feet roughly. Does that make sense? Yeah, that sounds about right. Because it's important to keep in mind that people are gonna pay a premium dollar per square foot for warehouse space and a less premium for office space, probably as you can tell with this economy that we're in right now. The larger percentage of the building is warehouse over office space, the better when it comes to valuations. So speaking of valuations, going into the third point of this video, which is understanding the market values. And you have to have a good understanding of your local market and sometimes the greater local market, which can be a couple counties, not just your local county, right? And I mean, in the state of New Jersey, I cover the entire state, 16 counties. Can we confirm that New Jersey has 16 counties? 21. 21, I knew, all right, second number. So going into point number three, I wanna talk about the market valuations, understanding your local markets and understanding how properties are valued, right? So, because when it comes to industrial real estate, properties are valued on a per square foot basis. And if you're just understanding your local county market, right? Like your little small county, a couple cities, for myself, who covers 21 counties, the entire state of New Jersey, and I need to understand how every county is broken down into a price per square foot basis. So when I'm speaking with a seller or a buyer, I can speak intelligently. What I want to share with you is like, listen, I'm not telling you to understand several different counties or the entire state wherever you live now tomorrow. I'm saying over time, you're going to want to spend some time every single week studying local markets and understanding the price per square foot ratios in certain areas. If you know for an absolute fact, that take South Beach as an example, because that's where I live now. If you even think that the local area is trading at $300 a foot, and you speak to somebody who's trying to sell an industrial property at $200 a foot, then you're probably gonna be like, hmm, this actually could be an interesting deal. Where if you had no idea, you might think it's a great deal or a bad deal right off the bat, and you have no freaking idea. You're gonna have to go to investors and say, hey, I got this property at 123 Main Street. I have no idea what this is a you know good deal or a bad deal. Can you tell me what you think? That does not sound professional. But when you can see what the most recent sales are, in certain counties or a certain city, and you can see, hey, these properties you're trading at an average of $200 a square foot, $250 a foot, $300 a foot, $100 a square foot in your local market. That way you can have a good understanding when you speak to the next seller and they say, oh yeah, I'm looking to sell my property for $100 a square foot. You're like, hmm, this sounds like a great deal. So spend some time each and every single week studying the most recent transactions. The larger properties, when you're gonna be over 50 or 100,000 square feet, are going to be more desirable, especially if, let's just say you have 200,000 square foot buildings. 100,000 square foot buildings, one's got 14 foot ceilings, the other one has 30 foot ceilings. You might see that these sell at a 20% valuation difference. Most people are gonna look for the higher ceiling property. And that doesn't even go to say, maybe one is maybe more motivated than the other. I've seen properties with 30 foot ceilings, gorgeous, great stuff, sell for less money because this person was a great negotiator and this person wasn't. Or this person was more motivated and this person wasn't. So it's finding those great opportunities in your local market because you know where things should be trading at and you want to find it less than the intrinsic value, the market value today. So if you can find stuff under the market value today, you're going to end up selling a lot more real estate, right? It's about finding great deals. If you can find great deals in the industrial world, especially because the industrial world is super hot right now, you're gonna be able to make a lot of money. Some of the best deals that we have found today are great off-market direct to seller industrial deals. The seller is finally just you know ready to retire. They've owned it for 25 plus years. They're an out-of-state owner and they're just like, listen, we're kind of done with this thing. Can you sell it for us? We're just looking to get rid of it. Okay, cool. Right, that's where you're gonna find great deals, but it's because we have local market knowledge of so many different areas in the state of New Jersey, people will come to us and the amount of outbound calls that we're making from those lead lists that we pull over and over and over and over and over again, right, we're able to find those sellers. Last thing I wanna talk about, the ending portion of this video, which is super crucial, is becoming a fantastic negotiator. If you want to grab the best deals in the marketplace before other people, you better become a great negotiator, which starts with, now that you've pulled the list and you've contacted these owners. You've asked them the right questions. This way you can underwrite the deal appropriately. You understand the local market so that you're at the point now where you've got all the information, you've got all the financials, you've underwritten the property. And you're like, okay, well the market value is here. Let's just say it's 5 million bucks. The seller said that they want $5.5 million. I'm going to make them an offer at a steal $3.8 million. You know why I do that? 
because I want to gauge how motivated they are to sell it. If we know that the market value is 5 million, there's probably not going to be an investor who's just ready to overpay, especially in this economy right now. So what my team is trained to do is that we underwrite deals fast and we make an offer 100% of the time every time on every lead that we generate. So what happens here is that on this example, we would make an offer of $3.8 million because I know I can sell it all day long for 4.5 or 5 million bucks. And guess what? When they come back to me and say, 3.8 is ridiculous. I would never sell a property at 3.8. I hear you loud and clear, John, no problem at all. So if it's not 3.8 million, what number gets this deal done? Uh, probably somewhere around 4.7, 4.8. We need to be there, not a penny less, somewhere in that range. Okay, good. Well, I already know the property's worth 5 million. I'll go to my investor and say, hey, I got a great deal at 4.7. You, you know, this is a deal, make it's under market value. There's a lot of upside in this deal. Can we make an offer today? Sure, done. I've already pre-negotiated because what's gonna happen is if I bring this deal, say, hey, the seller wants $5.5 million in this deal, what do you think? And they're gonna go, eh, it doesn't really make sense at 5.5. Make them an offer at 4.7. You know what's gonna happen here? They're gonna come in, right? With the same exact scenario. The only difference is, I'm I'm going to go back to that seller and I'm going to say 4.7. What do you think they're going to say? They're not going to just take it. They're probably going to say, huh, what about 5.1? Because I came in too high to start. I already know that that guy's going to tell me 4.7, 4.8, maybe just under 5 million. I'm going to go way lower and try to negotiate the best deal possible. If you can negotiate great deals for investors, you're going to make a lot more money. So if you want to dominate the industrial industry, make sure you rewatch this video a couple times over. And other than that, guys, I appreciate you so much. I'll see you in the next video. Take care.